Excellent. Fuller Craft Museum's mission, if you don't know, is to offer vast opportunities to discover the world of contemporary craft. We do that by exploring the leading edge of craft through exhibitions, collections, education, and public programs. And we challenge perceptions, building an appreciation of the material world. Our purpose is to inspire, stimulate, and enrich an ever-expanding community. And today we will accomplish many of those tasks here with our craft chat and our special guest, Alexandra Sheldon. Alexandra Sheldon is a collage artist who works and teaches out of her studio in Cambridge. She is inspired by many different mixed media techniques and combines them in small and large scale collages. Um, originally a landscape painter and her work is, current work is influenced by a painterly touch as you'll see shortly. Um, Alexandra joins us today because she's a part of our Snow Farm Mentors and Makers uh, exhibition currently on view. And she began teaching at Snow Farm in 1999. Um, She'll tell us more about this, but considers it a vital part of her life as a teacher and is currently represented by the Bromfield Gallery in Boston. Alexandra, welcome. Thank it's you. so great, great to have you here. It's great to be here. I'm totally honored to be <laughs> part of the, I mean, the uh, Fuller Craft in Brockton. Thanks so much. Um, do you want to add anything to that lovely introduction before we start looking through your slides? No, I think we should just start looking at the work. That would be great. All right. So um, hello, everybody. Um, we're going to go way back. I'm going to show you some of my roots as a painter. And then we're going to speed into the present. But this is some of my work from when I was very young, 25 years old, in Boston, EU Bridge. And um, I just want to show you where I came from. I'm not going to give a giant. Uh, slide talk. I'm going to give a very short slide talk. Um, so Sage, if you want to go on to the next image. Uh, when I was 25, I, I won a wonderful grant through the museum school in Boston, and I was able to move to Paris. And I lived in Paris for about a year and a half, where I met the person I'm married to now. He, hmm. he, he came back to America with me eventually. Um, if you want to keep going. Um, I was really, um, uh, you know, I was a landscape painter. I, I, that's all I wanted to do was paint outside with an easel. And uh, I was painting on canvas with oil. Next. Um, when I moved back from Europe, I kept doing landscapes and I started doing a lot of still lives. And I just wanted to show you the strange trajectory of uh, an artist. <laughs> um, keep going. Thank you. This is, um, but I would go back to France often and paint outdoors. And this is a painting done outside in the south of France. Next. And then I started mixing it up, uh, keeping sketchbooks, but doing a lot of abstraction. And I have to say, I have sped ahead many years, but the abstraction came into my work when I was asked to teach at Snow Farm when I was 41 years old. And I was asked to fill in for somebody who, who, who taught collage. And most artists make collages. Most painters, we, we play with collage. Collage is a playful, wonderful thing to do. Um, you know, I'm, when I was landscape painting, I would play with collage. Every, almost everybody does. But I, because I started, I fell in love with collage from teaching that one collage class at Snow Farm. And strangely enough, the teacher who had asked me to fill in, she decided to stop teaching at Snow Farm. So I picked up all her collage classes, which were many. Um, I would teach there about seven times a year, either for a three-day weekend or a five-day whole week long course. And um, I really was influenced by becoming a collage teacher. I fell in love hook, line, and sinker with all these different um, types of mark making. Um, but I've also always been a drawer. So these are from my, some of my uh, Marcus Vineyard notebooks. And, but I, you can see that there's a lot of abstract shapes, these kind of weird strands that I do. You wanna keep going. And this is done also on Martha's Vineyard. I was very interested in, for example, in this piece, 
um, getting some sand and shells from this murky little beach and putting them on a table and trying to copy the colors of all the funny little seaweedy colors. Um, mm. and, and just being, just wanting to look at everything and take apart everything and draw everything. And uh, I've worked in notebooks all my life. So this was from kind of a large notebook. I think it was about 18 inches by 12 inches. Uh, I also um, was asked to have a show about Cambridge where I live, but you can see that um, there's quite a lot of collage in this piece and I'm very interested in some of the abstraction in it. My mother has this piece and she's with us on this call. <laughs> Hi mom. So anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you can keep going and this one you can't really tell, but there's quite a lot of abstraction in this. And I just want to show you how I am trying to sort of uh, marry two different, distinct, different styles, painting from life and what I see, and also making marks that are more decorative and more textural and pretty non-objective, which is the word we used to use in art school for abstraction. Hmm. Uh, and in a second, we're going to jump into um, so the next slide. Thanks. And so then I'm always doing stuff like this. And um, this is this sort of linear, totally flat kind of interest I have in these strange, strandy things. And I've been drawing these. I actually figured out that I started drawing these when I was 17. I've been doing a lot of kind of doodling like patterns, like this kind of stuff you do when you're on the phone and you're not really engaged with what you're drawing. You kind of, yeah. They're kind of like the kind of um, glorified doodling. Next. I was gonna say it looks like a, um, like a language, like a coded language or something. Yeah, I actually, uh, one of my kids' math teachers saw me doodling in a notebook at a basketball game and he said you know you would be really good at math and I said that's funny because I'm really bad at math he said no you you have a mathematical mind next um I am showing just a smattering of some of the obsessions I've had over the years but this was I went through this one for about three months where I just all I wanted to do was lines interacting with each other uh and also studies of color now here mm. you start to see the more of the collage, which I'm doing all along, but I'm not, I'm not gonna show, I can't show you everything because I've been an artist pretty much like 45 years. And, but uh, next, and unfortunately this is a bad slide of a really nice painting, but I could not find the high resolution one. But this one actually has some collages of the house I grew up in. If you look on the right side, mm. you see a house, um, the house I grew up in, in Cambridge. Um, next. And there's another collage. And, um, in, and, and then actually this stuff, this piece and the next are pieces I just did during the lockdown because my husband and I went out into nature almost every afternoon. We would just like go kayak or we'd walk. And I started doing a lot of drawings of animals and I think they were kind of like prayers for our time because it was such it's such a hard time and trees are an obsession. I've been drawing them all my life. Next. And this is one of the pieces currently at the Fuller Craft. And this is the kind of work I'll show you when I give my little mini studio tour, which I'm about to do when we finish this. And this is also in the Fuller Craft. And this is the last image. So this work is really, um, these are, these are about 20 by 24 inches on paper. And this is my interest in making, obviously not looking at nature, but making art as if I'm a jazz musician. It's very much um, working instinctively. And um, it, it, it's like improvisation. It's mm. improv. And I'm, I'm as surprised as anybody else that I, you know, I went, did this full swing away from realism into these very abstract pieces. And um, I think one of the things 
I want to show you is, is, is um, I'll, I'll show you my studio and I'll show you some more of those pieces because I'm doing a whole series of them. Um, but I'm, I'm surprised and I, I kind of feel as if um, an artist can't always control what they make. And I didn't really know that when I was younger. I, I thought you could control what you make, but the older I get, the more I kind of think the materials dictate to me what to make. Um, and, you know, I haven't really mentioned my practice as a teacher, but I'm, I'm very busy as a collage teacher as well. Um, so, yeah, so yeah. tell us a little bit about, a little bit about that. Are you, so you're, you're <clears throat> motivated by process or by materials more? How does, how does inspiration kind of take, you know, bloom within you as an artist? <clears throat> well, I think it, it might be good if I show you my studio and then you might be. Okay, so um, I hope everybody can see and hear, but this is my studio in Cambridge and um, I'm gonna show you, people are always a little curious about artist studios. I'm just gonna show you the crazy materials that I have all over <laughs> in the back of my studio. Um, my books are very important. I teach with my books all the time. Um, and then down on the floor here, you see I'm, I kind of put these little signs up for myself when I'm teaching because I need to, I'm teaching of course on Zoom. So I have to have all these little notes written to myself and little reminders of what I'm doing. This is the area where I teach. And I have like kind of a stool with a lamp and, and this is my little place where I teach. But this is where I make work. And I, I'm just gonna show you my artist wall because every artist has like kind of a space that they throw up everything that inspires them. And I love this quote, don't try to analyze and create at the same time, they are different processes. That's a really beautiful quote. Don't try to analyze and create at the same time. They are different processes. That's helped me a lot to know that. Um, this is another wall of my own sort of inspiration. Stuff that I make that I like that I haven't really made into a collage, but I just like it. And I want to show you my door because I've got three important people here. Twyla Tharp, John Lennon, and Aretha Franklin. And sort of Lee Bontecou is there too, but people that inspire. <laughs> That's cool. Um, these are little collages that I make on cardboard. Um, I love doing small pieces. These are like six by five inches. I've also done some work about George Floyd. Um, I've been making some sort of love letters to him because so tragic what happened to him. Um, mm. Abstract collages. I want to show these two framed pieces that have a lot of reflection because these are abstract collages, but they're based on the colors in one of my landscapes that I've done. So mm. I sometimes study the colors in a landscape I've painted and then I copy the colors, paint papers, cut the papers up so it has a feel of a landscape. Wow. Um, so this is a small piece. And these are two pieces I made while I was teaching. So sometimes when I'm teaching and I'm showing people how to throw together collages and I, we have different themes in my classes, like we might try to use paint and collage at the same time. Things are, I'm teaching a lot about composition having darks, having lights, having space. Um, this, is, this is now my big wall that I'm gonna show with my current work, five of which are at the um, museum show. So these are some more pieces and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go up close because I kind of wanna show you a detail. Um, I just saw that someone asked me, you know, the, what's the largest collages I've made? I've done a lot of collages that are six by six feet on canvas. Um, I have one out in the hallway. I could go out in the hallway and show it to you. 
these are do you typically, what uh, do you typically work on canvas or do you work on paper i really work on paper much more okay um these are two pieces i re i recently did and actually um some of the stuff in these pieces were things i made while i was teaching because i was trying to show people how to make shapes that wrap around each other uh, hmm. somebody is asking another question about how things are sort of flattened on the screen but i'm going to go up close to this one because i love to show you details i think the details are nice there's newspaper there's painting there's silk screen printing in here Oh, wow. I, I have a technique that I swear by, which is that you paint whatever you feel like painting. And then you cut up the paintings for collage so that you don't feel uptight about painting into directly into a piece. In other mm -hmm. words, you get you're just so you're so loose. Because you are just making lots of stuff without having any eye on finishing anything, but then you throw it all together. So it's actually a technique that Robert Motherwell talks about. He talks about making, for example, ink paintings on Japanese paper and doing hundreds of them for months. And then they get thrown into his collages. Let's see if I can hmm. stand back. It's a little awkward. I've got, um, these are two pieces and I'll walk up close to this one. So I'm always doing these doodles and then they get thrown into the collage, the little stain things. And the, I have a lot of influence from Robert Motherwell, Helen Frankenthaler. Um, mm. I'm constantly teaching those guys, guys and girls. Um, I'm gonna, I wanna show you my table. So these are pieces that I might try to put together. And I actually put something over on a chair so you could see it better two chairs, um, you can see it. Now, this is one I haven't, I can't really stand back to show the whole thing, but I can show you a detail of it. So you can see my hand, like these are things that I haven't glued down at all, but I really like this stuff. I do um, quite a lot of silk screen printing hmm. and um, yeah, this, these are silk screen prints. Um, if anybody's curious about it, there's a technique called deconstructed screen printing with an amazing teacher named Kerr Grabowski. Um, so these are, this is my table. This is like, I might try and make a, it's hard to stand this back. Um, I might try and make a collage with something like this. I'm gonna show my hand. Um, I might make shapes. Alexander, how long, how long do you typically work on a piece? Um, oh gosh. Okay, so the work that's over on those walls, I might make two a day when I'm really working like six hours a day. But that doesn't happen that often. I don't get big chunk. I'm I teach three days a week, and there's so many things in life that get in the way. But yeah, I also do tons of small pieces. Like I just made, I make a lot of little pieces. Like I made this piece like three days ago and I made this, I make a lot of small work. I'm gonna go out in the hallway cause I wanna show one canvas. I think it might be fun for you to see it. Um, it would be really funny if I got locked out in it. So this is a painting. <laughs> this is a big painting. I can't really show the whole thing. I guess I can turn the camera, but I'm going to show it to you close up because it's got lots of drawings inside of it. So that's a detail of a canvas that's four by five feet. Actually, I think it's five by six feet. And I can't really stand back all the way, but I, you can see some of it. And and just, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, and here's, yeah. It's Martha Starr, and I was late getting in, so I might have missed something regarding this, but are you starting with a background painting? Yeah, I'm gonna show you one of my backgrounds. Okay. So I, I'm gonna to try to move this slower. Okay, so this is like a background piece of paper. It's on my table. 
And I love grounds like that. Yeah, I use a lot of, I'll, use, I'll start something on a ground. Here's another one, like something very simple. I'd like to start with something very simple. And are those and with uh, start, gouache or, or acrylic wood? That's silk screen. It's all silk screened, okay. It's not all silk screen. Like this one is, if I look, if I show you close up, it's um, really beautiful technique of doing darks, letting them dry and then covering them with a whitewash. Mm -hmm. But I am also using um, quite a, so many different materials. Like I might use fabric dye. So when you put a whitewash over a fabric dye, um, it, it bleeds through in a really interesting way. Um, something like this, is matte medium on newsprint, let that dry, and then cover it with a dark paint, like a wash in it. The matte medium becomes a resist. Um, somebody just asked me if I do any three-dimensional, um, I'm gonna switch to, I'll go over and just put this here while I take questions, but um, if, I, if I use any three-dimensional things in my work, and I would say the closest I come is actually in this piece, which has a lot of pine needles in it. So I'm pretty flat and I do not use that many objects, but I will use plants sometimes. So if that answers your question. Um, somebody just asked what kind of paper I like to make my ground on. And I love newsprint, but I work a lot of layers on newsprint if I use newsprint but I also like Bristol. I also, my favorite paper is like Reeves printmaking paper. Um, that's my favorite paper. But sometimes if paper is expensive, then you don't feel like you can get free on it. So then you get all uptight. I'm just gonna switch to, uh, this is my favorite kind of stuff that I make. And it's just like pinned up on the wall. Yeah, we have a lot of questions about, um... Your mediums. So, are you using acrylics? What are what what paints do you typically work with? Yeah, so I really like them. Um, this is what I really like to use. I'm just going to show it because it's kind of easier. I use this is my favorite um, adhesive. It's Utrecht acrylic matte medium. Mm -hmm. and this is my favorite thing to use. Um, but I will use glue oh, sticks. No and when I travel, I use a glue stick. So, like this. Oh, nice. One of my travel books, um, and I will take a little baggie with just a few materials, and then I, I when I, I used to travel. I don't seem to travel anymore, of course, but um, I really love using glue sticks when I travel. I do a lot of things like that. Something like with notebooks. I have. I love to do notebooks. I'm kind of a sketchbook artist, really. I, I seem to just, I'm turn this light off. I seem to really relax when I'm, you know, doing um, notebooks and traveling and sitting in a car and sketching trees or looking out of windows. And I'm just forever um, piecing my life together visually. And that's what yeah. I'm doing. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a little bit earlier about working on landscapes and then, um, you know, working from the colors in the landscapes. Do you do you conceptualize um, most of your works before you work, in, you know, work on the collage part or do you kind of just are how improvisational are you in your process? Well, I have an example of, of a time I was on a, on the ferry to uh, from Woods Hole to Martha's Vineyard and I the entire time I was on the ferry, I did studies of the color of the water, the ocean. And, but I was also doing studies of, of the land in March. And uh, this was a year ago, year and a half ago. And, you know, I did, then when we took the ferry back to Woods Hole, I did another hour of painting. When I got back to my studio the next day, after that weekend on the vineyard, I, I just, mixed up all the colors from my watercolor studies 
I painted papers for a week and then I made collages for, for, for a week. And actually I have one right here. And this is so funny. This is, this is one of my collages. It was really, it's all on a grid, but it was all really about the colors in March that I saw from the boat, the way the land looks sort of brown. And so, I mean, that's an example of what I might do. At Snow Farm, can you talk a little bit about how Snow Farm has influenced you, you and your work? Or what was it about that, that experience that kind of transformed you? Um, you know, I, I've kind of figured out that the, the three main times of my life, um, that, like being in art school was very social. And it, I will come back to your question, but it's, <laughs> being in art school was, was like time in the studio, but it was also very social. Having children, was very social, but then I also had time in the studio. And then when, as my kids started to become teenagers, which was right around the time I started uh, teaching at Snow Farm, they were starting to get more independent. They weren't quite teenagers, but they're getting more independent. There was something about teaching that became my new kind of social world that I needed. And I just fell in love with teaching. I fell in love with being with other people and I, I, I guess I've been told that teachers, um, teachers have a passion to share what they love. And I think what happened to me was it all coincided with teaching. It's that time I was asked to fill in for somebody at Snow Farm. It was like, I get to share my passion in life, which is art. And I also have this social element now that my kids are getting independent because that became less social. It just all was, it was a perfect fit. Um, I also think that I was starting to not hate landscape painting, but it was, landscape painting is, is pretty much the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It, it, you know, to sit out in the field and, and deal with the cold and the wind and the, all the things you have to deal with, because it, it, was, it was just so, such concentration. But making collage and teaching mixed media techniques was so fun. And I got back to the fun. And I think I became an artist as a teenager because it was fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fun was kind of being uh, drained out of it for me. And I, I will always love landscape painting. I'll, I'll always love drawing trees. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit split. I mean, I miss it a lot. I miss oils. I'm, I miss using oils. Um, but there were things in life that forced me to change. Like when I got pregnant, I didn't want to use oils so, because it was pretty toxic. So there are, it's just, there's all these big life movements that kind of influence this big change. And um, I love being with my students. I, I just have so much respect for them and we have so much fun together. And it's just, it, you know, this, this whole pandemic has really taught me how important the teaching has become in my life. It's like, it's kind of my community, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and I just get to play and the snow farm was about playing. Mm -hmm. I love the teachers at snow farm. I mean, the people, you know, I've, I've taught there long enough to know some that, that have died. I mean, we lost Pat Bennett. Um, I think she's in the show. She, she, she is. Died. Yeah. yeah. She, she was with one of the most fun people in the whole world. And just being at Snow Farm, I would go out there and be there for a week. And it was like this tremendous, uh, you know, shot of energy and, and, and joy. It was a joy, it's a joyous place. That's, right. that's all there is to it. That sounds yeah. amazing. <laughs> well, when people people when people are making something it's like cooking or gardening um it makes them happy and if people are happy they relax and when people are relaxed that's when they you really make art you know mm -hmm. yeah definitely um back to sort of technique and concept can you tell us a little bit um about um just like your your compositions like do you typically um work small and then make them into larger collage 
pieces no, or I, I, I have I'm very opinionated about this. I actually don't think there's any difference between realistic work and abstract work. So, you know, all the all the same things are at play. Like composition is vitally important. Color, light, space, movement. And so I'm constantly teaching these things. You know, I'm teaching um, maybe a piece is tonally too much the same. You need something really dark, or you need something really light, or you need, or, or uh, uh, a line just might look like it hangs off into space. Can you have it connect to something so it's, things are moving, so it's alive? You know, we want, we want artwork to go into this metaphysical place where it feels alive, where it feels like it's something kind of dead ends up feeling like it's like a balloon that takes off like it's like helium. It just kind of, you feel it when it happens and it's very magical. And that's what I try to do with my students. It's what I try to do with my own art. That's all I'm looking for. I'm looking for these sort of magic, magical connections. I will say that collage is especially fabulous for relationships of, of shapes in relationship to each other. And I don't think it's an accident that I seem to have tons of therapist students because their, their work is to help people in relationship, but collage is about putting shapes in conversation with each other. So I always think that that's kind of um, perfect. And maybe yeah. I, I could a therapist, that would have been a good thing to do with my life. But <laughs> hey, there's I'm always- a, I'm an art therapist. Exactly. I think many of us who, who are artists or are uh, layman arts therapists as well, helps us get through. Okay. I mean, I can't say enough about Snow Farm. Snow Farm changed my life. I started teaching there and it, it gave me um, another community. And it's also a place where it's unpretentious. It's not, it doesn't, it, it attracts non-artists and artists and the teachers and the students are very unpretentious. It just attracts people that want to have fun making things. And that's it's, it's just that simple. So it, there's there's great sophistication at Snow Farm, and there's there's great unsophistication, and it's all <laughs> yeah. So Snow Farm, for those of you who don't know, is a residential craft school out in Western Mass in Williams Bird. Town Bird. No, it's Bird. Bird. Yeah, yeah, not, not to, be, to be confused yeah. with Williamstown, yeah. which um, many people do. Ah, right. Um, it's it's yeah. seven miles from Northampton, and it's um, it's it's an old farm, and people um, take classes. There's usually about anywhere from four to seven classes that are held. They could be glass blowing, sculpture, collage, landscape painting. Um, there's been, uh, there used to be quite a lot of photography. There's less photography now, um, ceramics. But, you know, I, I might be teaching a class. I always get this one studio that's in this big barn. And you can smell the ceramic. Um, what was Bob Green? What was he, he's doing the- Pit firing. Um, yeah, what is that called? Smoke, Smoke from pit firing or raku firing? Raku, the Raku, uh, Bob Green would always do the Raku firing and we'd get this beautiful smell. And then I would go and look for the burnt pieces of newspaper that were kind of around the fire pit and uh, and then bring them back to my students. And that, I mean, it was just like, yeah, it's really great. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a long way from home for me. And um, mm -hmm. I can't think enough about it. It's just, it's, it's just a really, you, anyway, you've got your meals and you get these little, uh, places to, to sleep, you know, little rooms. And um, I even went there this fall. We were very careful. We had a limited amount of students and wore masks and I had taught behind the plexiglass and people got tested and it seemed very safe, so. Yeah, I know. Has um, COVID really, has it COVID changed your practice at all as an artist or a teacher? It changed my practice completely because I was teaching two groups of students on during the week and all of a sudden there was lockdown and I, and I wasn't coming to my studio and so I started teaching on zoom and um, 
I had to teach on Zoom because I owed my students some more classes. And, and then I thought, oh, I'll just send out a notice about doing this to my mailing list, which has hundreds of people on it because I've been teaching you know, for 25 years or 24 years. And, um, and then all of a sudden I had like 80 people on the class on Zoom and it was a little too much. It was a little nerve wracking, but I, I have a, um, somebody I hired help me. And now the classes have um, quieted down, but I have an average of um, about 25 people every Thursday in my drop-in class. And then I have a Friday class that's just for the people who used to come to my studio in person because we're very close and there's like 20 of us. So um, that's, yeah, I'm busy. I'm really busy. And I also joined a gallery in Boston and that's been a, a wonderful, another community. So it has, it's been a busy time for me. And that's good because what I've learned about teaching during the, co the pandemic is that we need more than ever to make things. You know, yeah. be, you know, the importance of baking bread, it's like, okay, make a collage and be with other people and, and I'll read poetry aloud or do something that kind of lowers the, you know, we just, we have to get, we have to get a little calm because it's, uh, this is nerve wracking time. It's hard, it's scary. Martha? I put this in the chat, but I don't think you've read it. But um, Alexandra, when you're done with a piece, how do you fix it so that you're not discoloring anything, but you're still protecting it from either disintegrating or falling apart? Or, um, you know, I tend to use a lot of fabric and paper and other little things, and I can't varnish them? Uh, the way I work, I'm using a lot of acrylic paints and the glue itself is actually quite archival, the matte medium. Yeah. Um, but I, did, I urge you not to worry about that. There's quite a few artists, um, for example, the Darn Twins who are kind of giants. They, I went to school with them and I thought they were little punks and then they became like the most famous graduates of the museum school. It's mm -hmm. like color. But they, their work is, is their photography. If you don't know their work, look it up, the Starn Twins. Their, their work is sort of meant to be, it, it, it does age, it does fall apart. It, a lot of their early work, their scotch tape photographs. So things, I mean, it's an archivist nightmare, but I, I, don't, I don't think you should worry too much about it. The, the only time I really pay attention to that is if I've got raw newsprint and raw newsprint is such an unarchival paper, it will turn dark brown. Mm -hmm. So if I have a collage with some raw newsprint, I will often mix up the color of newsprint and paint that over. So it's painted newsprint. It looks like regular I newsprint. I, I, I never did worry about this until I was critiqued and was told, what, it, what is your thinking about these things lasting? And I guess things lasting wasn't my priority, but it was on the part of the people who were looking at it. Um, yeah, uh, the Starn Twins, it's S-T-A-R-N. Somebody just asked me, Starn Twins. Um, yeah, uh, there's also a wonderful artist at Brick Bottom in Somerville. And I wanna say her name, she wrote the bookworm. Thank you. So, pipe up, but anyway, she does a lot of collage that has things falling apart. And um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I do get that question a lot. I get the question, you know, like I saw a Joseph Cornell show about 10 years ago. I think it was at the Danforth. It was somewhere where the Essex uh, Museum. It was many years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And Joseph Cornell was a wonderful collage artist who died in the 70s. And he did a lot of collages made up with magazine parts. Oh, thank you, Rosie Purcell. Thank you. Rosie Purcell wrote Bookworm. Joseph Cornell's collages were, they, when they made that exhibit, they had to have them almost in the dark because they were using magazines. So they were very light sensitive. And so that, that made an impression on me that, um, you, know, you know, his work was, was very sensitive, but I don't use very many magazine parts. I guess the way I teach and, the, and, and my angle on collage is to get people to make their own materials. So they paint papers and they mix colors and then they draw doodles and then they um, 
we sort of make a lot of our own stuff. We do use magazines sometimes, but just not that much. Um, but I, I love magazines. I, I use them for color chip uh, resources sometimes. Um, my question is about transfers. Um, I've often wanted to transfer, say, from a newspaper or a magazine or type or something onto fabric or paper or something. And, um, you know, I've never really found a good way to do it. Um, okay, you... well, I can tell you in a second how to do it. So this is what you want. And this is backwards on the screen, but it's acrylic matte medium. Okay. And if you just take a brush and you brush it on a piece of paper, you brush the matte medium on the paper and you put your magazine piece face down. And then you take one of these, um, take one of these scrapers. I use these for collage. They're like, they're available in paint stores. And you sort of squish, you kind of squish down the magazine thing and try and get the glue from between both surfaces. And you let it stick for 20 seconds and then you peel off the magazine, it will leave a transfer. And newspaper will work even faster. So just play with that, play with squishing papers together with matte medium and peeling them apart. You will get transfers. And then give me a call because I can show you. <laughs> okay. You're around the corner for me. But um, so if I, if I do this transfer on um, fabric because I'm a textile designer, um, is it washable or permanent in any way or? Oh, I have no idea. I'm yeah. not, yeah, I'm not very, um, yeah, I have done transfers on fabric, but I collage the fabric down first. And I don't know, I do use fabric in collages sometimes, but not very much. I'm mostly sort of a paper girl. Okay, yeah, thanks. I, I uh, highly recommend Snow Farm classes, uh, taking them with uh, Alexandra. It was just a wonderful experience. My question for you is, in order to continue with an art practice of what are some tips or a, a tip that you would give to people like for instance every day set a timer for five minutes to draw on a post-it pad or a newspaper or or right. something I, I got it I mean I, I can honestly say that the artist way by Julia Cameron is one of the great books of, of our time Julia Cameron um, really understands the, um, the grief of not being creative, the grief of bl being blocked. And that book has incredible exercises, but the, probably most people on this call know about the, the Artist Way book. But what she does is she suggests that people write for just 10 or 15 minutes in the morning. And um, my, my book is right here because I started writing when I was nervous when this was about to start, because I write, I just write in this notebook a lot, but I am also allowed to draw. I'm allowed to doodle. I am allowed to do anything in this book. It's always near me. Um, I say that, that's funny I say that, because I just left it at the studio for a couple of days and I didn't have it. But this is like my notebook. I just try to draw a little bit or write and what Julie Cameron says is that if you can just do a little a tiny bit of something creative, then it makes for a less guilty, less anxious day because we, we're all creative. Everybody's creative and everybody suffers from not making. It's, it's kind of a, it's a really important that, you know, you know, you think of high school and, and how, or just think of children and how they, they make stuff in kindergarten, you know, we're trying to get back to that because that's something that children have and then they lose it. But sometimes you get a great teacher. I had a couple of great teachers when I was a teenager. That's a really critical age for creativity. And you can see how teenagers start to draw smaller and tighter. And um, I used to teach children drawing and I know that um, when kids start to get really tight, like as, as preteens, it's, it's actually because they need to learn how to draw because they, they, they really want to, they want to start drawing realistically and then it doesn't look right. So they get tighter and tighter. So there's all these developmental stages. Um, and it's just fabulous if you can just get, 
kids lots of art classes. That's why, you know, the, the art, the music, music too, it's just so important. Just a little bit, just do morning pages and read Julia Cameron's book. I also recommend tw anything by Twyla Tharp. Um, she wrote a book called The Creative Habit. Twyla Tharp talks about, um, you know, almost everybody has a friend or two that supports their cre creativity. Like make sure that they're the one that you talk to about your creativity, like we made this, rather than somebody that goes, oh, that's just, you know, whatever. But like somebody who believes in how you cook or how you garden or how you make things or how you knit. So it's just, there's just all these little techniques. And I think Twyla Tharp and Julia Cameron, just start with them. The Creative Habit by Twyla Tharp and Julia Cameron, The Artist Way. These are very, they're, they're like brilliant women. Absolutely just brilliant people. Awesome. Thank you. I, I could just say that I, people don't think I struggle with my own creativity. They're like, oh, you make so much art. You, you know, you're really doing it. I struggle every day with my creativity. I struggle, um, you know, all my life people also said to me, you're lucky you know what you are because I knew I was an artist since, since when I was a teenager. But under the umbrella of being an artist, there's like a million different kinds of art to make. And that, that was very confusing. Um, but I do struggle with my creativity. I, I struggle because I can, I rarely feel like I have enough time. It's, mm -hmm. Time management issues, you know, I want to exercise, I want to spend time with my family and my husband, and I, I love animals, and I love being outside, and how do I do all this, how do I balance it all, how do I teach so much and then do the work, you know, these are the things that are, that I have found the hardest to, to figure out. Yeah, speaking of management, do you have um, any systems for organizing your your stuff? It sounds, seems like you have lots of little bits and pieces and how do you keep everything organized? Well, I first of all, I have an intern who, who helps me on every Zoom call that I, every time I teach on Zoom, I have an intern who helps me because I can't, I, I, I get a little overwhelmed by technology. I also, um, I, I've had an, a studio assistant for years and she helps me about, two hours every two weeks. And now of course it's all virtual, but she helps me do all the kind of technical things I need to do. Like if I'm sending slides or trying to sell something to a, to a consultant and I just, I just can't, I hate that stuff. It feels like homework. Um, and actually I've hired somebody in New York who's helping me organize my imagery so that I could give a real one hour lecture. Um, I wanna do a lecture on sketchbooks. I wanna do a lecture on a whole life's work. Um, I love to write a book about making collage. I have all the notes, but I don't like, to, you know, then I'd, I'd have to spend two years doing that. So I want, I just want to make art, you know, teach and make art. That's what I like to do. <laughs> is your studio organized or is it just things everywhere? Oh, yeah. I, no, it is organized. Like if you look, you, that's pretty good. I mean, she picked it. Pretty good. Now, are those all sorted by like color or shape or how do you, how do you do that? switch the screen. I'm just going to show you like right here. I have a tape. See all the tapes are in one thing. Tape pens, um, phones, you know, inks. I mean, I guess it looks, see, I think my studio looks really cleaned up. I think it's very, this, this is a really cleaned up studio right now. That looks like that looks it's cool. really good. No, no. Uh, yeah, this is the whole studio. I didn't show everybody my skylight. I just want to show my skylight because I'm kind of proud of it. It's so pretty. It makes me. Yeah. Uh, I could end with this picture of George O'Keefe because I saw this at a friend's house a long time ago, and I said to my friend, "If I could look at that picture every day, I wouldn't be afraid of aging." And she said, oh. and then she sent it to me. It came to the studio in a big package. She got a copy of it and had it framed and sent it to me. And I love that. Um, yeah, I have like, you know, down, under the tables, I have markers. There is some, you know, there's some, there's some chaos. I have a lot of stools because I used to have students that came into this room. I'll tell you one thing, it's been really great in some ways for me not to have to clean up my studio, to have my classes in here because that was kind of, I always had to sort of erase myself and take everything off the walls. Mm. 
anyway, this, that's it. Awesome. A method to the madness for sure. Well, somewhat, you know, um, as people, as we get older, a lot of my artist friends and I were saying to each other, like, what happens if we die? What's, how's somebody going to clean up the studio? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what are they going to do with, what are they going to do with all this stuff? <laughs> oh, yeah. I love it. Um, Alexander, I want to thank you again for joining us today. It was really a pleasure to speak with you, to learn about your process, to see your incredible studio and all the things that are, are happening um, in your studio and, and with your teaching and, and sharing a little bit about your experiences as a teacher, uh, especially uh, at Snow Farm. And I just want to encourage everyone to visit us at Fuller Craft Museum to see the Snow Farm. Uh, mentors and makers uh, exhibition which is up now through July 4th so there's a lot of time for everyone to make their way to Fuller Craft Museum and experience some of Alexander's work and the other talented artists um, in the show. We are open um, for to the public for um, a few days uh, for the winter. Our, our hours are uh, 10 to 5 on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. So again thank you so much and um, join us again for our next craft chat, everyone. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. This is really fun.